TTS Talking Early Years podcast and I am Alice Sharp, your host for today. A little bit me, I'm not an academic, oh, I'm not a theorist, I am a thinker, a responder, a person who loves to play. My favourite thing to do is to talk about play, which is quite handy really because that's what we're doing today. Play-based learning, child-led pedagogy, leading children to learn what better way to spend a day. The science is telling us that children of the alpha generation have spent more time in virtual reality than in reality before they turn five. So that means this glorious little series is going to highlight how we can support play that is going to be compatible to the virtual world. Spectacular play for the 21st century. And today joining us, sharing her practice, her thoughts, her inspirations, is Mariana Caruso, a play-based learning advocate. I am delighted to introduce you to Mariana. Welcome to the podcast, Mariana. How are you today? Hi, thank you so much, Alice. It's a pleasure to be here on board. Um, I'm beyond thrilled to be able to share my experience and hope that many other educators can actually um, join this ride of play. mentioned play a lot Mariana already and I wonder what is play for for lots of people it might bring up connotations of something a wee bit different and I've got to start with some quotes in fact um and I've got one here from Stuart Brown who's an MD uh, an American psychiatrist in fact and he says play energizes us and enlivens us it eases our burdens it renews our natural sense of optimism and it opens us up to new possibilities then I've got another one by Carl Jung. The creation of something new is not accomplished by the intellect, but by the play instinct. Oh, I like that one. Another one by Diane Ackerman. Play is our brain's favourite way of learning. And the last one I'll, I'll share. A child loves his play, not because it's easy, but because it's hard by Benjamin Spock. So that's what those people said. What do you see play is all about? Well, I want to start by saying that play is an innate response of the child. Every single child loves to play. So we get to see children uh, playing at home, playing in, on the street, playing wherever they want to go. And they go, they actually, well, the first thing they do is play. And we find ourselves in a world in which the first thing that we are doing is depriving children from play. So it does not make sense. Um, we have um, school systems giving play as a reward and limited to a recess. And we have children who go back to, back home to just plug themselves into the TV and iPads and screens. And families with such um, fast paces in their lives that the most convenient thing is to just give their children a screen. So little by little, um, this innate response has not been served by us adults. We are not promoting play as much as we used to do. Back in the day when we were growing up, there were no, not much screens and we had no other option than to figure it out and make it work. Right now, I think that we are in a moment in life in which um, actually, we have to, to work a little bit harder towards having children play because there are more obstacles. I don't see techno technology itself as something bad. I just think that we need to learn how to use it wisely. So play for me is a right. Play is an innate response of the child. And as um, Piaget and Maria Montessori said, play is the work of the child. Children like to work best through play. There's research that supports how movement is crucial for the brain and yeah. how mental health needs play. A child needs to play in order to have a strong brain. And as parents and educators, we want children to have the best of the best and the best of the best happens through play. And, and, and absolutely. And I guess as adults as well, 
you know, the sadness is that we don't play the way that children play unless we do our job and we're really lucky because we do it. Because I've been, you know, I've taught in Japan, I've taught in Beijing, I've taught in Nashville, I've taught in Cyprus, I've taught all over the world. And every child you see plays because they want to do it. Now, I think as adults, we want to do it as well. And we play slightly differently, I suppose, at cinema, going to the cinema, or sharing a, a conversation with um, you know, one of our friends about books or about a painting when you're walking through an art gallery might be the way we're playing. But it has a huge impact on the way your understanding and your developmental processes um, are uh, blossoming, I guess. So how do you think the play that you're talking about, Mariana, um, influences the way that children develop? Um, that's a very good question. And I want to actually summarize what you said. Play is a universal language. We don't need to speak to be able to understand ourselves when we play. And play evolves over time. Play never ends. But society has such a strong push towards children to actually end playing by age eight or nine, which is super sad. Um, and it's on us to actually inform children that play never ends. It evolves with you. It evolves over time. And play looks different at every age. Yeah. When the child has the right to play, the child is by um, default having the right to learn because play is learning. So when we start playing, we start playing with our body when we are just born. We are born playing. Then we move into different stages of play um, and they look different over the first six years of our lives. But it is actually the most crucial thing children should be doing. And it influences their lives because when you actually engage into a meaningful experience, that meaningful experience will actually shape your life forever. If I ask you, Alice, to think about your childhood and close yeah. your eyes, the first thing that will pop up will be a play experience. So my question is, why aren't we teaching everything through play? If it's their universal language, if it's an innate response, if we know that's how they learn best, why aren't we choosing that pathway? What made us lose our track into teaching differently? Who are we, we pleasing? Are we pleasing the children? Are we pleasing the adults? Who are we working for? And our audience is, and the answer will be children. Yeah. And, and the child, event, child developmental processes that are almost a hidden part of play. Um, you know, I guess sometimes um, some teachers, some educators talk about play and they only mean the free play, the intrinsically motivated play of the child. And they, they believe that there should be no learning intention or, you know, we shouldn't have a purpose to the play. Now, if we are educationalists and we are in an educational establishment, I think we might not lead by a, an intention or an outcome, but we intend learning to take place and happen. You know, if I notice a child's manual dexterity is not good, I'm going to provide play experiences that help the child develop the manual dexterity skills, the pencil grip and tripod grip, in hand manipulation. Or if we notice a child is not interested in creative play, creative play is one of my favourite areas of play. You know, play that allows a unique response from every child, it allows me to transform the information and understanding I have into an action and a response. It offers the element of surprise, of the unknown outcome. And if I can see that a child is avoiding creatively engaging in their number play or, um, you know, avoiding creatively using the pizza boxes to create a tower, then of course I am going to start to be a partner in that play and encourage them down, down a developmental pathway. You know, yeah. what, what, what do you think we could say to anybody who's listening that really doesn't think that the play we offer should be structured and I'm not meaning totally structured but structured in a way that that learning actually takes place because I love the fact that you said that play is learning because it is learning yeah and and this is an amazing question and I'm very glad that you popped it out um play it's seen in different ways and of course there are different uh, researchers and there are different uh play advocates who see things in different ways my my way of thinking is that 
There are different types of play, especially within the classroom. We will have the open-ended play and these um, commonly seen as free play and we'll have the symbolic play. And this is the, the moment in which the child leads the way. They are actually the leaders to their own play experiences they will be creating. I absolutely love having open-ended play and block play because I think it is the best way to develop executive functions. We will talk about that a little bit later. Um, so play in an open-ended spectrum will be 100% child-led. And this is where we will develop also a lot of 21st century skills. On the other hand, I'm a true believer that there are things that need to be taught because children will never discover them through open-ended play experiences, which means that we will jump into playful learning. There's a lot of research by Harvard University yeah. around playful learning, and it's absolutely amazing if you have the chance to look it up. And there, there, that's where we jump in, and that's where we, as educators, our first task is to observe. We will be observing play schemas. We will be observing play, um, child development, and we will take notes on that, where the child is at, what, what are the child's preferences, and then we will develop our own teaching experiences to meet specific goals. But we will use play as a vehicle for learning. So here, it will be more of a, it's not 100% child-led because the teacher knows where we are headed, what we, what will goal will be, but we will be actually inviting children into playful learning experiences. Instead of flat learning, we will be actually provoking and inviting children into learning their numbers, their letters, their traces based on developmental um, needs and and ages. Of course, we're not going to have a two year old tracing, but um, writing can also happen at two. Writing at two happens when you play with droppers and waters, when we pour um, yeah. from a pitcher to a bowl. It depends on how you see learning. Um, reading happens at age three and four when we're doing nursery rhymes, um, when we are clapping sounds. Um, so I am actually a huge advocate for playful learning because children engage into playful experience in one second and they actually start discovering new passions and they start seeing learning as play and i think you've mentioned two things that i wanted to pick up on stages of play you talked about you know we need to recognize that children go through different stages and this this thinking that you know i think you and i are similar that we're not theorists but you need to know the theory you need to know the the kind of developmental processes you need to know the stages you need to be very aware of you know the play-based learning from harvard i love um Howard Garner's stuff from Harvard University. I'm thinking of Tina Bruce's um, features of play or Bob Hughes um, with his 16 play types. Because one of my favourite play types is recapulative play, play that allows children to explore their history, the rituals that are a part of their everyday life, the heritage and ancestry that they belong to. You know, and I think that we will never know all about that if we don't do a bit of research and a bit of reading and we don't have these dialogues that you and I are having just now. And the stages of play that you mentioned earlier on, I feel as if in a way we've lost sight of that a wee bit. Um, and one of my stages when I observe children is the amount of children that watch other children. So looking on play, if you like, um, which is uh, the second stage. And and we don't celebrate that enough and we don't encourage it enough. Um, how do you feel we should be as educators encouraging each other to learn more about learning? And you know what, you just mentioned something that it's crucial. We are not wired to observe and pause. And that is the first step to me. Um, we are so worried about what we have to teach that we forget that part of that teaching is observing the child, creating an image of the child. Who is that child? What does the child need? What are the preferences? 
What are the play schemas? I absolutely love play schemas because I think those are the best hooks to get children into learning. When you observe what they like and you actually provide learning experiences with those play schemas, yeah. play schemas it is absolutely thrilling to watch. Um, so I do believe that as play-based learning um, educators, we do have to first observe, learn how our standards look like because sometimes we worry way too much and i dis i've discovered that it's not the amount of repetitions of um like standards or um ex exposing the child to many and multiple repetitions of a specific concept it is about the quality of the experience if you make a really meaningful experience the child will learn what you want to teach so my perfect recipe would be know the child, make an image of the child, observe, and then think about your curriculum and how can you make it happen in, a, an, in an amazing and meaningful um, way? How can you translate those standards into action through play and don't overdo it. Like simplicity is key. Children love simplicity. It's about invitations to play. It's about um, actually displaying materials in an engaging way. It's about um, having a dialogue with a child. Teaching um, in the early years is about talking and talking to the children and discussing the, the actually the activity and the um, invitation to play and uh, wonder, wonder what they are thinking and asking these open-ended questions is also key in the process. And I think that's a lovely way to end this little conversation that we've had here. We started talking about and wondering about together what is play and now we realise at the end of our little conversation it's really important that the play we participate in and share with the children makes an impact, that it has an impact. Wow, fantastic. Thank you for that little burst of, of wonderful insight into what play could look like for us all. Well, oh my goodness me, that has just been a joy and a, an honour and a privilege to share time with you today, Mariana. I cannot thank you enough for joining us on our podcast today. Uh, so all it leaves me to say is a huge thank you on behalf of everybody that's uh, tuning in um, to you for being with us and for sharing all of that fabulous insight into how play can really make a difference and make an impact for our children. Mm -hmm.